So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan Amouncy, aka Dr. D from Woodland Hills Cameras and Telescopes. Our website is telescopes.net, but I guess uh, Mr. Simon's going to put that on the video. We're here with Kevin Lagore, who handles all, he's basically the eyes and the ears of Skywatcher USA. He handles everything. Um, and today we have the SkyMax 180, which is a really awesome Maxutov Cassegrain that I'm personally excited about. And Kevin's going to tell us a little bit about it. Kevin, do you have anything you'd like to tell us about the mount that we see here and the Mac? So this is the SkyMax 180, which is basically the largest Maxitoff in our lineup. Full 7-inch aperture, f15, so it's 2700 millimeter focal length. So we pack a ton of focal length inside a relatively small tube. Uh, fully multi-coated meniscus, 94% reflectivity on the mirrors and it does have a conical mirror in the back for fast cooling and then internal focus moving the primary mirror up and down uh, with very minimal uh, mirror shift in there too so it keeps it nice and tight perfect for lunar and planetary imaging um, give you a diagonal two inch diagonal two inch visual back 50 millimeter finder and a two inch 28 millimeter eyepiece all awesome. included in that. And I heard that you can use a 6.3 reducer, I guess, with it, if you yeah, wanted to, theoretically. It does have schmidt cassegrain threads on the back, so you can use external focusers if you want. Um, we have tested it with a, a schmidt cassegrain 6.3 reducer, mm -hmm. so those are, those are usable for visual use. I have not personally tested it photographically, but they do yeah. work visually. Visually, it would be fine. I just find it fascinating that the Mac Cast is not as popular as, like, say, like an eight-inch conventional eight-inch SCT. Because I have, in my experiences of 25 years, I have looked through uh, seven-inch uh, Mac Cast screens, and I've been really impressed with them. You know, but do you have any thoughts or opinions on the Mac? Is kind of one of those I would I'd actually phrase it more as the hidden gem. Yeah. in the astronomy world because they're going to give you a near APO refractor image yeah. um, and obviously you can make a larger Maxitop a lot easier than you can make a large refractor but I think that some of the people that are scared away from it is you know you hear a lot of these scary stories about cooling it takes a long time for cooling mm -hmm. or they're heavy or whatever the reason may be but most of us are setting up an hour or two beforehand. You're going to go eat dinner. You're going to chat with friends while you're at a star party. The scope is going to have enough time to equalize. You never just throw it out there and suddenly you're looking. I mean, I suppose people do that all the time. But in reality, you're going to take your time setting up your stuff. And during that time, it's going to cool down. So your thermal problems aren't as big of a deal. But we find that with the Max are incredibly sharp and they don't have coma. They're flat field because of the meniscus. Um, they're essentially a near perfect optical design. Yeah, but it looks that way. They, I do think they get overshadowed because you do. they are harder to make. The meniscus is a much more extreme curve. It's a lot thicker piece of glass. So they do get overshadowed by their, their Schmidt Cassegrain cousins. And the mirror is conical though. It's not yeah, the that mirror's, thick. I mean, it's not. Mirror is only not, about yeah, that thick. It's pretty reasonable. And the meniscus, you know, on a, on a Mac is typically thicker compared to like the corrector you would see like on a conventional SCT, which is like, you know, roughly like, you know, the thickness of a pencil, so to speak. This is a few times that it seems like. Or yeah, a these are times, so. these are fairly thick. thick pieces of glass, yeah. but Still. you're getting it's not as big of a problem as a lot of people make it out to be. Yeah, and we've found that the more people who use them, especially if you're a lunar or planetary, you know, fanatic. Yep. This, the 180 is the top dog in the lineup. The, um, there's different ways that you can observe. There's <clears throat> a lot of people are under the impression that light gathering is like the most important thing and having a large telescope, but that's not always the case. In fact, um, sometimes the aperture can work against you. And I'll tell you what an instance where a smaller, uh, ref more refined type of telescope like this is good to have. Let's say I observe in a city. Well, I can't look at galaxies very well because no matter how big a telescope is, they're not going to look that good. Globular clusters are still going to look relatively uh, faint and nebula are certainly going to be affected by light pollution. So you have to think about your demographic of objects or things that, type of things that you want to see. I myself like to look at the moon and the planets and carbon stars and double stars and variable stars. And there are different types of objects for that. And you do not necessarily 
uh, need large aperture for that. In fact, there are some cases, or often many cases, where you don't even want a large scope for that. So here's what happens. The bigger the scope is, the more resolving power it has. And what happens is that when you look at stars at high magnification, the airy disk, or the uh, appearance of that star, gets smaller. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, that's a great thing. But what happens is that you get that tiny, tiny little area disk. It's so small when you have a big telescope. There is extraneous junk around it from the increased aperture. And what happens is it starts to boil and move and mix around. When you decrease the aperture, that little airy disk, that little star starts to appear larger. So when you zoom in on it, you see an actual airy disk. And what happens is the star appears to look more stable or more still. It's similar to like what you would see, say, with you are looking at the planets with your naked eye. You notice the planets don't twinkle as much. But when you look at stars, the stars twinkle and the planets don't. And part of that is because your eye is actually starting to resolve the disk of a planet. And stars sort of behave like that in a small telescope where the airy disks get larger and thus they don't move around as much. The other thing is, um, you know, the stars look pretty sometimes in a smaller aperture like what you get. This is more of a kind of a specialized kind of scope for visual observation of those types of objects. And if their stars are not twinkling so much from increased aperture, the colors look uh, less bleached out. Sometimes when you have too much aperture, the stars get washed up and get bleached out. So you got to think, think, you can think of it as more of a kind of a refined kind of a look for a very specialized kind of observing. And you want to take those, th take that into consideration when you're making a choice for a telescope like this.